Preparations for Battle, An Indian Village on the Move, Scalp Dance, A Horrible Scene of Savage Exultation, Compelled to Join the Orgies, A Cause of Indian Hostility, Another Battle with the White Troops, Burial of an Indian Boy, A Hasty Retreat, Made to Act as Surgeon of the Wounded, Mauve Terre or Bad Lands. The next morning the whole village was in motion. The warriors were going to battle against a white enemy, they said, and old men, women, and children were sent out in another direction to a place of safety, as designated by the chief. Everything was soon moving. With the rapidity of custom, the tent poles were lowered and the tents rolled up. The cooking utensils were put together and laid on crossbeams, connecting the lower ends of the poles as they trail the ground from the horse's sides, to which they are attached. Dogs, too, are made useful in this exodus, and started off, with smaller burdens dragging after them, in the same manner that horses are packed. The whole village was in commotion, children screaming or laughing, dogs barking or growling under their heavy burdens, squaws running hither and thither, pulling down teepee poles, packing up everything, and leading horses and dogs with huge burdens. The small children were placed in sacks of buffalo skin and hung upon saddles or their mother's backs. The wrapped-up lodges, which are secured by thongs, are fastened to the poles on the horses' backs, together with sundry other articles of domestic use, and upon these are seated women and children. To guide the horse a woman goes before, holding the bridle, carrying on her back a load nearly as large as the horse carries. Women and children are sometimes mounted upon horses, holding in their arms every variety of plunder, sometimes little dogs and other forlorn and hungry-looking pets. In this unsightly manner, sometimes two or three thousand families are transported many miles at the same migration, and, all being in motion at the same time, the cavalcade extends for a great distance. The men and boys are not so unsightly in their appearance, being mounted upon good horses and the best Indian ponies, riding in groups, leaving the women and children to trudge along with the burdened horses and dogs. The number and utility of these faithful dogs is sometimes astonishing, as they count hundreds, each bearing a portion of the general household goods. Two poles, about ten or twelve feet long, are attached to the shoulders of a dog, leaving one end of each dragging upon the ground. On these poles a small burden is carried, and with it the faithful canine jogs along, looking neither to the right nor to the left, but apparently intent upon reaching the end of his journey. These faithful creatures are under the charge of women and children, and their pace is occasionally encouraged with admonitions in the form of vigorous and zealous use of whips applied to their limbs and sides. It was quite painful to me to see these poor animals, thus taken from their natural avocation, and forced to a slavish state of labor, and compelled to travel along with their burdens. Yet, when this change has been made, they become worthless as hunters or watchers, and even for the purpose of barking, being reduced instead to beasts of burden. It was not uncommon to see a great wolfish-looking dog moodily jogging along with a lot of cooking utensils on one side, and on the other a crying papoose for a balance, while his sulking companion toils on, supporting upon his back a quarter of antelope or elk, and is followed by an old woman, or some children, who keep at bay all refractory dogs who run loose, occasionally showing their superiority by snapping and snarling at their more unfortunate companions. This train is immensely large, nearly the whole Sioux nation having concentrated there for the purpose of war. The chief's sisters brought me a horse saddled, told me to mount, and accompany the already moving column, that seemed to be spreading far over the hills to the northward. We toiled on all day. Late in the afternoon we arrived at the ground of encampment, and rested for further orders from the warriors, who had gone to battle and would join us there. I had no means of informing myself at that time with whom the war was raging, but afterward learned that General Sully's army was pursuing the Sioux, and that the engagement was with his men. 
In three days the Indians returned to camp, and entered on a course of feasting and rejoicing, that caused me to believe that they had suffered very little loss in the affray. They passed their day of rest in this sort of entertainment, and here I first saw the scalp dance, which ceremonial did not increase my respect or confidence in the tender mercies of my captors. This performance is only gone through at night, and by the light of torches, consequently its terrible characteristics are heightened by the fantastic gleams of the lighted brands. The women, too, took part in the dance, and I was forced to mingle in the fearful festivity, painted and dressed for the occasion, and holding a staff from the top of which hung several scalps. The braves came vauntingly forth, with the most extravagant boasts of their wonderful prowess and courage in war, at the same time brandishing weapons in their hands with the most fearful contortions and threatenings. A number of young women came with them, carrying the trophies of their friends, which they hold aloft, while the warriors jump around in a circle, brandishing their weapons and whooping and yelling the fearful war-cry in a most frightful manner, all jumping upon both feet at the same time, with simultaneous stamping and motions with their weapons, keeping exact time. Their gestures impress one as if they were actually cutting and carving each other to pieces, as they utter their fearful, sharp yell. They become furious as they grow more excited, until their faces are distorted to the utmost. Their glaring eyes protrude with a fiendish, indescribable appearance, while they grind their teeth and try to imitate the hissing, gurgling sound of death in battle. Furious and faster grows the stamping, until the sight is more like a picture of fiends in a carnival of battle than anything else to which the war-dance can be compared. No description can fully convey the terrible sight in all its fearful barbarity, as the bloody trophies of their victory are brandished aloft in the light of the flickering blaze, and their distorted forms were half concealed by darkness. The object for which the scalp is taken is exultation and proof of valor and success. My pen is powerless to portray my feelings during this terrible scene. The country seemed scarred by countless trails, where the Indian ponies have dragged lodge poles, in their change of habitations or hunting. The antipathy of the Indian to its occupation or invasion by the white man is very intense and bitter. The felling of timber, or killing of buffalo, or travelling of a train, or any signs of permanent possession by the white man, excites deadly hostility. It is their last hope. If they yield and give up this, they will have to die, or ever after be governed by the white man's laws. Consequently, they lose no opportunity to kill or steal from, and harass the whites when they can do so. The game still clings to its favorite haunts, and the Indian must press upon the steps of the white man, or lose all hope of independence. Herds of elk proudly stand with erect antlers, as if charmed by music, or as if curious to understand this strange inroad upon their long-secluded parks of pleasure. The mountain sheep look down from belting crags that skirt the perpendicular northern face of the mountains, and yield no rival of their charms or excellence for food. The black and white-tailed deer and antelope are ever present, while the hare and the rabbit, the sage-hen, and the prairie chicken are nearly trodden down before they yield to the intrusion of the stranger. Brants, wild geese, and ducks multiply and people the waters of beautiful lakes, and are found in many of the streams. The grizzly and cinnamon bears are often killed and give up their rich material for the hunter's profit and the buffalo, in numberless herds, with tens of thousands in a herd, sweep back and forth, filling the valley as far as the eye can reach, and adding their value to the red man both for food, habitation, fuel, and clothing. The Big Horn River, and mountains and streams beyond, are plentifully supplied with various kinds of fish. The country seems to be filled with wolves, which pierce the night air with their howls, but, like the beavers whose dams encumber all the smaller streams, and the otter, are forced to yield their nice coats for the Indian as well as white man's luxury. The Indians felt that the proximity of the troops and their inroads through their best hunting grounds would prove disastrous to them and their future hopes of prosperity, 
and soon again they were making preparations for battle. And again, on the 8th of August, the warriors set forth upon the warpath, and this time the action seemed to draw ominously near our encampment. An Indian boy died the night before, and was buried rather hastily in the morning. The body was wrapped in some window curtains that once draped my windows at Geneva. There was also a red blanket, and many beads and trinkets deposited on an elevated platform with the mouldering remains, and the bereaved mother and relatives left the lonely spot with loud lamentations. There seemed to be great commotion and great anxiety in the movements of the Indians, and presently I could hear the sound of battle and the echoes that came back to me from the reports of the guns in the distant hills warned me of the near approach of my own people, and my heart became a prey to wildly conflicting emotions, as they hurried on in great desperation, and even forbid me turning my head and looking in the direction of the battle. Once I broke the rule, and was severely punished for it. They kept their eyes upon me, and were very cross and unkind." Panting for rescue, yet fearing for its accomplishment, I passed the day. The smoke of action now rose over the hills beyond. The Indians now realized their danger, and hurried on in great consternation. General Sully's soldiers appeared in close proximity, and I could see them charging on the Indians, who, according to their habits of warfare, skulked behind trees, sending their bullets and arrows vigorously forward into the enemy's ranks. I was kept in advance of the moving column of women and children, who were hurrying on, crying and famishing for water, trying to keep out of the line of firing. It was late at night before we stopped our pace, when at length we reached the lofty banks of a noble river, but it was some time before they could find a break in the rocky shores which enabled us to reach the water and enjoy the delicious draught, in which luxury the panting horses gladly participated. We had travelled far and fast all day long, without sensation, through clouds of smoke and dust, parched by a scorching sun. My face was blistered from the burning rays, as I had been compelled to go with my head uncovered, after the fashion of all Indian women. Had not had a drop of water during the whole day. Reluctant to leave the long-desired acquisition, they all lay down under the tall willows, close to the stream, and slept the sleep of the weary. The horses lingered near, nipping the tender blades of grass that sparsely bordered the stream. It was not until next morning that I thought of how they should cross the river, which I supposed to have been the Missouri. It was not very wide, but confined between steep banks. It seemed to be deep and quite rapid. They did not risk swimming at that place, to my joy, but went further down, and all plunged in and swam across, leading my horse. I was very much frightened, and cried to heaven for mercy. On that morning we entered a gorge, a perfect mass of huge fragments which had fallen from the mountains above. They led my horse, and followed each other closely, and with as much speed as possible, as we were still pursued by the troops. During the day some two or three warriors were brought in wounded. I was called to see them, and assist in dressing their wounds. This being my first experience of the kind, I was at some loss to know what was best to do, but, seeing in it a good opportunity to raise in their estimation, I endeavoured to impress them with an air of my superior knowledge of surgery, and as nurse or medicine woman. I felt now, from their motions and meaning glances, that my life was not safe, since we were so closely pursued over this terrible barren country. My feelings at this time cannot be described, when I could hear the sound of the big guns as the Indians term cannon. I felt that the soldiers had surely come for me, and would overtake us, and my heart bounded with joy at the very thought of deliverance, but sank proportionately when they came to me, bearing their trophies, reeking scalps, soldiers' uniforms covered with blood, which told its sad story to my aching heart. One day I might be cheered by strong hope of approaching relief, then again would have such assurance of my enemy's success as would sink me correspondingly low in despair. For some reason deception seemed to be their peculiar delight. 
whether they did it to gratify an insatiable thirst for revenge in themselves, or to keep me more reconciled, more willing and patient to abide, was something I could not determine. The feelings occasioned by my disappointment in their success can be better imagined than described, but imagination, even in her most extravagant flights, can but poorly picture the horrors that met my view during these running flights. My constant experience was hope deferred that maketh the heart sick. It was most tantalizing and painful to my spirit to be so near our forces and the flag of liberty, and yet a prisoner and helpless. On and still on we were forced to fly to a place known among them as the Bad Lands, a section of country so wildly desolate and barren as to induce the belief that its present appearance is the effect of volcanic action. Great boulders of blasted rock are piled scattering round, and hard dry sand interspersed among the crevices. Everything has a ruined look, as if vegetation and life had formerly existed there, but had been suddenly interrupted by some violent commotion of nature. A terrible blight, like the fulfilling of an ancient curse, darkens the surface of the gloomy landscape, and the desolate, ruinous scene might well represent the entrance to the infernal shades described by classic writers. A choking wind with sand blows continually, and fills the air with dry and blinding dust. The water is sluggish and dark, and apparently life-destroying in its action, since all that lies around its moistened limits has assumed the form of petrification. Rocks, though they now seemed, they had formerly held life, both animal and vegetable, and their change will furnish a subject of interesting speculation to enterprising men of science, who penetrate those mournful shades to discover toads, snakes, birds, and a variety of insects, together with plants, trees, and many curiosities, all petrified and having the appearance of stone. I was startled by the strange and wonderful sights. The terrible scarcity of water and grass urged us forward, and General Sully's army in the rear gave us no rest. The following day or two we were driven so far northward, and became so imminently imperiled by the pursuing forces, that they were obliged to leave all their earthly effects behind them, and swim the Yellowstone River for life. By this time the ponies were completely famished for want of food and water, so jaded that it was with great difficulty and hard blows that we could urge them on at all. When Indians are pursued closely, they evince a desperate and reckless desire to save themselves, without regard to property or provisions. They throw away everything that will impede flight, and all natural instinct seems lost in fear. We had left, we had left, in our compulsory haste, immense quantities of plunder, which proved immediate help, but in the end a terrible loss. General Sully with his whole troop stopped to destroy the property, thus giving us an opportunity to escape, which saved us from falling into his hands, as otherwise we inevitably would have done. One day was consumed in collecting and burning the Indian lodges, blankets, provisions, etc., and that day was used advantageously in getting beyond his reach. They travel constantly in time of war, ranging over vast tracts of country, and prosecuting their battles or skirmishes with a quiet determination unknown to the whites. A few days' pursuit after Indians is generally enough to wear and tire out the ardor of the white man, as it is almost impossible to pursue them through their own country with wagons and supplies for the army, and it is very difficult for American horses to traverse the barren, rugged mountain passes, the Indians having every advantage in their own country, and using their own mode of warfare. The weary soldiers return disheartened by often losing dear comrades, and leaving them in a lonely grave on the plain, dissatisfied with only scattering their red foes. But the weary savages rest during these intervals, often sending the friendly Indians, as they are called and believed to be, who are received in that character in the forts, and change it for a hostile one as soon as they reach the hills, to get supplies of ammunition and food with which they refresh themselves and prosecute the war. 
After the attack of General Sully was over, an Indian came to me with a letter to read, which he had taken from a soldier who was killed by him, and the letter had been found in his pocket. The letter stated that the topographical engineer was killed, and that General Sully's men had caught the Red Devils and cut their heads off, and stuck them up on poles. The soldier had written a friendly and kind letter to his people, but ere it was mailed, he was numbered with the dead. End of chapter 9 Morning for the slain, threatened with death at the fiery stake, saved by a speech from Ottawa, starving condition of the Indians. As soon as we were safe, and General Sully pursued us no longer, the warriors returned home, and a scene of terrible mourning over the killed ensued among the women. Their cries were terribly wild and distressing on such occasions, and the near relations of the deceased indulge in frantic expressions of grief that cannot be described. Sometimes the practice of cutting the flesh is carried to a horrible and barbarous extent. They inflict gashes on their bodies and limbs an inch in length. Some cut off their hair, blacken their faces, and march through the village in procession, torturing their bodies to add vigor to their lamentations. Hunger followed on the track of grief. All their food was gone, and there was no game in that portion of the country. In our flight they scattered everything, and the country through which we passed for the following two weeks did not yield enough to arrest starvation. The Indians were terribly enraged, and threatened me with death almost hourly and in every form. I had so hoped for liberty when my friends were near, but alas, all my fond hopes were blasted. The Indians told me that the army was going in another direction. They seemed to have sustained a greater loss than I had been made aware of, which made them feel very revengeful toward me. The next morning I could see that something unusual was about to happen. Notwithstanding the early hour, the sun barely appearing above the horizon, the principal chiefs and warriors were assembled in council, where, judging from the grave and reflective expression of their countenances, they were about to discuss some serious question. I had reason for apprehension, from their unfriendly manner toward me, and I feared for the penalty I might soon have to pay. Soon they sent an Indian to me, who asked me if I was ready to die, to be burned at the stake. I told him whenever Wakantanka, the great spirit, was ready, he would call for me, and then I would be ready and willing to go. He said that he had been sent from the council to warn me, that it had become necessary to put me to death on account of my white brothers killing so many of their young men recently. He repeated that they were not cruel for the pleasure of being so. Necessity is their first law, and he and the wise chiefs, faithful to their hatred for the white race, were in haste to satisfy their thirst for vengeance, and further, that the interest of their nation required it. As soon as the chiefs were assembled around the council fire, the pipe-carrier entered the circle, holding in his hand the pipe ready lighted. Bowing to the four cardinal points, he uttered a short prayer or invocation, and then presented the pipe to the old chief, Ottawa, but retained the bowl in his hand. When all the chiefs and men had smoked, one after the other, the pipe-bearer emptied the ashes into the fire, saying, Chiefs of the great Dakota nation, Wakantanka give you wisdom, so that whatever be your determination, it may be conformable to justice. Then after bowing respectfully, he retired. A moment of silence followed, in which every one seemed to be meditating seriously upon the words that had just been spoken. At length, one of the most aged of the chiefs, whose body was furrowed with the scars of innumerable wounds, and who enjoyed among his people a reputation for great wisdom, arose. Said he, The pale faces, our eternal persecutors, pursue and harass us without intermission, forcing us to abandon to them, one by one, our best hunting grounds, and we are compelled to seek a refuge in the depths of these bad lands, like timid deer. Many of them even dare to come into prairies which belong to us, to trap beaver and hunt elk and buffalo, which are our property. 
these faithless creatures, these outcasts of their own people, rob and kill us when they can. Is it just that we should suffer these wrongs without complaining? Shall we allow ourselves to be slaughtered like timid Assiniboines without seeking to avenge ourselves? Does not the law of the Dakotas say, Justice to our own nation and death to all pale faces? Let my brothers say if that is just, pointing to the stake that was being prepared for me. Vengeance is allowable, sententiously remarked Mapea, the sky. Another old chief, Ottawa, arose and said, It is the undoubted right of the weak and the oppressed, and yet it ought to be portioned to the injury received. Then why should we put this young, innocent woman to death? Has she not always been kind to us, smiled upon us, and sang for us? Do not all our children love her as a tender sister? Why, then, should we put her to so cruel a death for the crimes of others, if they are of her nation? Why should we punish the innocent for the guilty? I looked to heaven for mercy and protection, offering up those earnest prayers that are never offered in vain, and, oh, how thankful I was when I knew their decision was to spare my life. Though terrible were my surroundings, life always became sweet to me when I felt that I was about to part with it. A terrible time ensued, and many dogs and horses even died of starvation. Their bodies were eaten immediately, and the slow but constant march was daily kept up in hope of game and better facilities for fish and fruit. Many days in succession I tasted no food, save what I could gather on my way. A few rose leaves and blossoms was all I could find, except the grass I would gather and chew for nourishment. Fear, fatigue, and long-continued abstinence were wearing heavily on my already shattered frame. Women and children were crying for food. It was a painful sight to witness their sufferings, with no means of alleviating them, and no hope of relief save by traveling and hunting. We had no shelter save the canopy of heaven, and no alternative but to travel on, and at night lie down on the cold, damp ground for a resting place. If I could but present to my readers a truthful picture of that Indian home at that time, with all its sorrowful accompaniments. They are certainly engraved upon faithful memory to last for ever, but no touch of pen could give any semblance of the realities to another. What exhibitions of their pride and passion I have seen! What ideas of their intelligence and humanity I have been compelled to form! what manifestations of their power and ability to govern had been thrust upon me. The treatment received was not such as to enhance in any wise a woman's admiration for the so-called noble red man, but rather to make one pray to be delivered from their power. Compelled to travel many days in succession, and to experience the gnawings of hunger without mitigation, every day had its share of toil and fear. Yet while my temporal wants were thus poorly supplied, I was not wholly denied spiritual food. It was a blessed consolation that no earthly foe could interrupt my communion with the heavenly world. In my midnight, wakeful hours, I was visited with many bright visions. He walks with thee, that angel kind, and gently whispers, Be resigned, bear up, bear on, the end shall tell, the dear Lord ordereth all things well. End of chapter 10 Meet another white female captive. Sad story of Mary Boyeau. A child roasted and its brains dashed out. Murder of Mrs. Fletcher, five children slaughtered, fate of their mother. It was about this time that I had the sorrowful satisfaction of meeting with a victim of Indian cruelty, whose fate was even sadder than mine. It was a part of my labor to carry water from the stream at which we camped, and, awakened for that purpose, I arose and hurried out one morning before the day had yet dawned clearly, leaving the Indians still in their blankets and the village very quiet. In the woods beyond I heard the retiring howl of the wolf, the shrill shriek of the bird of prey as it was sweeping down on the unburied carcass of some poor murdered traveller, and the desolation of my life and its surroundings filled my heart with dread and gloom. 
I was so reduced in strength and spirit that nothing but the dread of the scalping knife urged my feet from task to task. And now, turning toward the teepee, with my heavy bucket, I was startled to behold a fair-faced, beautiful young girl sitting there, dejected and worn like myself, but bearing the marks of loveliness and refinement, despite her neglected covering. Almost doubting my reason, for I had become unsettled in my self-reliance and even sanity, I feared to address her, but stood spellbound, gazing in her sad brown eyes and drooping, pallid face. The chief stood near the entrance of the teepee, enjoying the cool morning air, and watching the interview with amusement. He offered me a book, which chanced to be one of the Wilson's readers stolen from our wagons, and bade me show it to the stranger. I approached the girl, who instantly held out her hand and said, "'What book is that?' The sound of my own language, spoken by one of my own people, was too much for me, and I sank to the ground by the side of the stranger, and endeavouring to clasp her in my arms, became insensible. A kindly squaw, who was in sight, must have been touched by our helpless sorrow, for, when recovering, she was sprinkling my face with water from the bucket, and regarding me with looks of interest. Of course, we realized that this chance interview would be short, and perhaps the last that we would be able to enjoy, and, while my companion covered her face and wept, I told my name and the main incidents of my capture, and I dreaded to recall the possible fate of my Mary, lest I should rouse the terrible feelings I was trying to keep in subjection as my only hope of preserving reason. The young girl responded to my confidence by giving her own story, which was related to me as follows. My name is Mary Boyeau. These people call me Maddie. I have been among them since the massacre in Minnesota, and am now in my sixteenth year. My parents were of French descent, but we lived in the state of New York, until my father, in pursuance of his peculiar passion for the life of a naturalist and a man of science, sold our eastern home, and came to live on the shores of Spirit Lake, Minnesota. The Indians had watched about our place, and regarded what they had seen of my father's chemical apparatus with awe and fear. Perhaps they suspected him of working evil charms in his laboratory, or held his magnets, microscopes, and curiously shaped tubes in superstitious aversion. I cannot tell, I only know that we were among the first victims of the massacre, and that all my family were murdered except myself, and, I fear, one younger sister. "'You fear?' said I. "'Do you not hope that she escaped?' The poor girl shook her head. "'From a life like mine, death is an escape,' she said bitterly. "'Oh, it is fearful, and a sin to rush unbidden into God's presence, but I cannot live through another frightful winter.' No, I must and will die if no relief comes to me. For a year these people regarded me as a child, and then a young man of their tribe gave a horse for me, and carried me to his teepee as his wife. "'Do you love your husband?' I asked. A look, bitter and revengeful, gleamed from her eyes. "'Love a savage who bought me to be a drudge and slave,' she repeated. "'No!' I hate him as I hate all that belong to this fearful bondage. He has another wife and child. Thank God, she added with a shudder, that I am not a mother. Misery and the consciousness of her own degraded life seemed to have made this poor young creature desperate. And, looking at her toil-worn hands and scarred arms, I saw the signs of abuse and cruelty. Her feet, too, were bare, and fearfully bruised and travel-marked. "'Does he ill-treat you?' I inquired. "'His wife does,' she answered. "'I am forced to do all manner of slavish work, "'and when my strength fails, I am urged on by blows. "'Oh, I do so fearfully dread the chilling winters "'without proper food or clothing, "'and I long to lie down and die "'if God's mercy will only permit me "'to escape from this hopeless imprisonment. "'I have nothing to expect now.' I did once look forward to release, but that is all gone. I strove to go with the others, who were ransomed at Fort Pierre, 
and Mrs. Wright pled for me with all her heart. But the man who bought me would not give me up, and my prayers were useless. Mr. Dupuy, a Frenchman, who brought a wagon for the redeemed women and children, did not offer enough for me. And when another man offered a horse, my captor would not receive it. There are many prisoners that I did not see in the village, but I am left alone. The Yanktons, who hold me, are friendly by pretense, and go to the agencies for supplies and annuities, but at heart they are bitterly hostile. They assert that, if they did not murder and steal, the father at Washington would forget them, and now they receive presents and supplies to keep them in check, which they delight in taking, and deceiving the officers as to their share in the outbreaks. Her dread of soldiers was such that she had never attempted to escape, nor did she seem to think it possible to get away from her present life, so deep was the despair into which long-continued suffering had plunged her. Sad as my condition was, I could but pity poor Mary's worse fate. The unwilling wife of a brutal savage, and subject to all the petty malice of a scarcely less brutal squaw, there could be no gleam of sunshine in her future prospects. True, I was like her a captive, torn from home and friends, and subject to harsh treatment, but no such personal indignity had fallen to my lot. When Mary was first taken, she saw many terrible things which she related to me, among which was the following. One day the Indians went into a house where they found a woman making bread. Her infant child lay in the cradle, unconscious of its fate. Snatching it from its little bed, they thrust it into the heated oven, its screams torturing the wretched mother, who was immediately after stabbed and cut in many pieces. Taking the suffering little creature from the oven, they then dashed out its brains against the walls of the house. One day on their journey they came to a narrow but deep stream of water. Some of the prisoners, and nearly all of the Indians, crossed on horseback, while a few crossed on logs which had been cut down by the beaver. A lady, by name Mrs. Fletcher, I believe, who was in delicate health, fell into the water with her heavy burden, unable, on account of her condition, to cross, and was shot by the Indians, her lifeless body soon disappearing from sight. She also told me of a white man having been killed a few days previous, and a large sum of money taken from him, which would be exchanged for articles used among the Indians when they next visited the Red River or British possessions. They went, she told me, two or three times a year, taking American horses, valuables, etc., which they had stolen from the whites, and exchanging them for ammunition, powder, arrow points, and provisions. Before they reached the Missouri River, they killed five of Mrs. Dooley's children, one of which was left on the ground in a place where the distracted mother had to pass daily in carrying water from the river. And when they left the camp, the body remained unburied. So terrible were the sufferings of this heartbroken mother, that, when she arrived in safety among the whites, her reason was dethroned, and I was told that she was sent to the lunatic asylum, where her distracted husband soon followed. Mary wished that we might be together, but knew that it would be useless to ask, as it would not be granted. I gave her my little book and half of my pencil, which she was glad to receive. I wrote her name in the book, together with mine, encouraging her with every kind word and hope for the future. She could read and write and understand the Indian language thoroughly. The book had been taken from our wagon, and I had endeavored to teach the Indians from it, for it contained several stories, so it made the Indians very angry to have me part with it. For hours I had sat with the book in my hands, showing the pictures and explaining their meaning, which interested them greatly, and which helped pass away and relieve the monotony of the days of captivity which I was enduring. Moreover, it inspired them with a degree of respect and veneration for me when engaged in the task, which was not only pleasant but a great comfort. It was by this means they discovered my usefulness in writing letters and reading for them. I found them apt pupils, willing to learn, and they learned easily and rapidly. 
their memory is very retentive, unusually good. End of chapter 11 First intimation of my little Mary's fate, despair and delirium, a shower of grasshoppers, a feast and a fight, an enraged squaw, the chief wounded. One day, as I was pursuing what seemed to me an endless journey, an Indian rode up beside me, whom I did not remember to have seen before. At his saddle hung a bright and well-known little shawl, and from the other side was suspended a child's scalp of long, fair hair. As my eyes rested on the frightful sight, I trembled in my saddle and grasped the air for support. A blood-red cloud seemed to come between me and the outer world, and I realized that innocent victim's dying agonies. The torture was too great to be endured, a merciful insensibility interposed between me and madness. I dropped from the saddle as if dead, and rolled upon the ground at the horse's feet. When I recovered, I was clinging to a squaw, who, with looks of astonishment and alarm, was vainly endeavoring to extricate herself from my clutches. With returning consciousness, I raised my eyes to the fearful sight that had almost deprived me of reason. It was gone. The Indian had suspected the cause of my emotion and removed it out of sight. They placed me in the saddle once more, and not being able to control the horrible misery I felt, I protested wildly against their touch, imploring them to kill me, and frantically inviting the death I had before feared and avoided. When they camped, I had not the power or reason to seek my own tent, but fell down in the sun where the chief found me lying. He had been out at the head of a scouting party, and knew nothing of my sufferings. Instantly approaching me, he inquired who had misused me. I replied, No one, I want to see my dear mother, my poor mother, who loves me, and pines for her unhappy child. I had found by experience that the only grief with which this red nation had any sympathy was the sorrow one might feel for a separation from a mother, and even the chief seemed to recognize the propriety of such emotion. On this account I feigned to be grieving solely for my dear widowed mother, and was treated with more consideration than I had dared to expect. Leaving me for a few minutes, he returned, bringing me some ripe wild plums, which were deliciously cooling to my fever-parched lips. Hunger and thirst, sorrow and fear, with unusual fatigue and labor, had weakened me in mind and body, so that, after trying to realize the frightful vision that had almost deprived me of my senses, I began to waver in my knowledge of it, and half determined that it was a hideous phantom, like many another that had tortured my lonely hours. I tried to dismiss the awful dream from remembrance, particularly as the days that followed found me ill and delirious, and it was some time before I was able to recall events clearly. About this time there was another battle, and many having already sank under the united misery of hunger and fatigue, the camp was gloomy and hopeless in the extreme. The Indians discovered my skill in dressing wounds, and I was called immediately to the relief of the wounded brought into camp. The fight had lasted three days, and, from the immoderate lamentations, I supposed many had fallen, but could form no idea of the loss. Except when encamped for rest, the tribe pursued their wanderings constantly, sometimes flying before the enemy, at others endeavoring to elude them. I kept the record of time as it passed with the savages, as well as I was able, and, with the exception of a few days lost, during temporary delirium and fever at two separate times, and which I endeavored to supply by careful inquiry, I missed no count of the rising or setting sun, and knew dates almost as well as if I had been in the heart of civilization. One very hot day, a dark cloud seemed suddenly to pass before the sun, and threaten a great storm. The wind rose, and the cloud became still darker, until the light of day was almost obscured. A few drops sprinkled the earth, and then, in a heavy, blinding, and apparently inexhaustible shower, fell a countless swarm of grasshoppers, covering everything, and rendering the air almost black by their descent. 
it is impossible to convey an idea of their extent. They seem to rival Pharaoh's locusts in number, and no doubt would have done damage to the food of the savages had they not fallen victims themselves to their keen appetites. To catch them, large holes were dug in the ground which are heated by fires. Into these apertures the insects are then driven, and, the fires having been removed, the heated earth bakes them. They are considered good food, and were greedily devoured by the famishing Sioux. Although the grasshoppers only remained two days, and went as suddenly as they had come, the Indians seemed refreshed by feasting on such small game, and continued to move forward. Halting one day to rest beside good water, I busily engaged myself in the chief's teepee or lodge. I had grown so weak that motion of any kind was exhausting to me, and I could barely walk. I felt that I must soon die of starvation and sorrow, and life had ceased to be dear to me. Mechanically I tried to fulfill my tasks, so as to secure the continued protection of the old squaw, who, when not incensed by passion, was not devoid of kindness. My strength failed me, and I could not carry out my wishes, and almost fell as I tried to move around. This met with disapprobation, and, better fed than myself, she could not sympathize with my want of strength. She became cross and left the lodge, threatening me with her vengeance. Presently an Indian woman, who pitied me, ran into the teepee with great haste, saying that her husband had got some deer meat, and she had cooked it for a feast, and begged me to share it. As she spoke she drew me toward her tent, and, hungry and fainting, I readily followed. The chief saw us go, and, not disdaining a good dinner, he followed. The old squaw came flying into the lodge like an enraged fury, flourishing her knife and vowing she would kill me. I rose immediately and fled, the squaw pursuing me. The chief attempted to interfere, but her rage was too great, and he struck her, at which she sprang like an infuriated tiger upon him, stabbing him in several places. Her brother, who at a short distance beheld the fray, and deeming me the cause, fired six shots, determining to kill me. One of these shots lodged in the arm of the chief, breaking it near the shoulder. I then ran until I reached the outskirts of the village, where I was captured by a party who saw me running, but who knew not the cause. Thinking I was endeavoring to escape, they dragged me in the tent, brandishing their tomahawks, and threatening vengeance. After the lapse of half an hour, some squaws came and took me back to the lodge of the chief, who was waiting for me before his wounds could be dressed. He was very weak from loss of blood. I never saw the wife of the chief afterward. Indian surgery is coarse and rude in its details. A doctor of the tribe had pierced the arm of the chief with a long knife, probing in search of the ball it had received, and the wound thus enlarged had to be healed. As soon as I was able to stand, I was required to go and wait on the disabled chief. I found his three sisters with him, and with these I continued to live in companionship. One of them had been married, at the fort, to a white man, whom she had left at Laramie when his prior wife arrived. She told me that they were esteemed friendly, and had often received supplies from the fort, although at heart they were always the enemy of the white man. "'But will they not suspect you?' asked I. "'They may discover your deceit and punish you some day.' She laughed derisively. "'Our prisoners don't escape to tell tales,' she replied. "'Dead people don't talk. We claim friendship, and they cannot prove that we don't feel it. Besides, all white soldiers are cowards.' Shudderingly I turned away from this enemy of my race, and prepared to wait on my captor, whose superstitious belief in the healing power of a white woman's touch led him to desire her services. The wounds of the chief were severe, and the superation profuse. It was my task to bathe and dress them, and prepare his food. Hunting and fishing being now out of the question for him, he had sent his wives to work for themselves, keeping the sisters and myself to attend him. War with our soldiers seemed to have decreased the power of the chief to a great extent. As he lay ill, 
he evidently meditated on some plan of strengthening his forces, and finally concluded to send an offer of marriage to the daughter of a war chief of another band. As General Sully's destructive attack had deprived him of all ready offerings, he availed himself of my shoes, which happened to be particularly good, and, reducing me to moccasins, sent them as a gift to the expected bride. She evidently received them graciously, for she came to his lodge almost every day to visit him, and sat chatting at his side, to his apparent satisfaction. The pleasure of this new matrimonial acquisition on the part of the chief was very trying to me, on account of my limited wardrobe, for as the betrothed continued in favor, the chief evinced it by giving her articles of my clothing. An Indian woman had given me a red silk sash, such as officers wear. The chief unceremoniously cut it in half, leaving me one half, while the coquettish squaw received the rest. An Indian husband's power is absolute, even to death. No woman can have more than one husband, but an Indian can have as many wives as he chooses. The marriage of the chief was to be celebrated with all due ceremony when his arm got well. But his arm never recovered. Mr. Clemens, the interpreter, tells me, in my late interview with him, that he still remains crippled and unable to carry out his murderous intentions, or any of his anticipated wicked designs. He is now living in the forts along the Missouri River, gladly claiming support from the government. End of chapter 12